Hello, I'm Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you to Genetics. In today's session, we're going to discuss, under the general topic of chromosomes, we're going to talk about sex determination. And I arranged it this way for a reason. So we've now learned about the general properties and arrangements of chromosomes. We've understood how they move during mitosis and meiosis. And now we're ready to look at a couple of other interesting aspects of the idea that Mendel's genes are, in fact, located on chromosomes, right? Those ideas, I still want you to keep integrating them in your, in your head. I know that you know this, but historically, remember that we've, the way we're talking about it, we've just put these two ideas together. So when talking about sex determination, while that is an important topic, we also want to highlight the difference of the X and Y chromosomes, at least in, in mammals, with all of the other chromosomes. And then in a subsequent uh, lecture, we're going to see what happens when a gene happens to be located on the X chromosome. But let's start with sex determination. So uh, it may seem like an obvious statement to say that most animals are either one sex or another. In fact, uh, certainly that's normally true for human beings. We're either male or female. Um, I don't know if it would surprise you to learn that in many cases this isn't actually true. Uh, there are many true hermaphroditic animals and there's all sorts of strange things that can go on. But we want to start in a, the most simple way. So we're going to assume animals like a human being are one sex or the other, cats are male or female. So the chromosome complement of male and fe males and females, let's just use humans, we both have 46 chromosomes. But the chromosome complement, and what I mean is a certain particular aspect of that chromosome complement, will normally determine whether someone develops as a male or as a female. So one thing we've alluded to before, but we've never directly said, is that in humans, remember we said out of the, one way to look at the 46 is that there are 23 pairs, right? And it turns out that 22 of those pairs are what we call autosomes. Now we've used, we've referred to that word before, but autosomes, it doesn't mean they're not important chromosomes. They're vitally important for life. It just means that they have nothing to do with sex determination. And the autosomes don't differ in any appreciable way between men and women. It's the last pair, what by convention is thought of as the 23rd pair, that is the sex chromosomes. And there are two different types of sex chromosome that's the only pair where that's possible. But even if they're different, we still consider that a homologous pair. So one pair of sex chromosomes, every human being has that. And the X and the Y are possible uh, sex chromosomes that one might have. So we're going to figure out how this works. But probably you know that under normal circumstances, and just as a quick disclaimer, when I say normal, I'm not implying that people as we're going to see some irregularities here are abnormal. I just mean the way it usually happens, right? So normally with that understanding, females, when it comes to the sex chromosome pair, have two X's. So actually, this is uh, the least strange if you want to think of it that way, because just like they have two number ones and two number twos, they have two X's. And those could have been numbered if we wanted to. In fact, you guys know that all the chromosomes pretty much look like X's but they named it the X because of the possibility of the Y also being paired with it and the X and the Y don't look very much like each other. The Y honestly really doesn't look that much like a Y, but that's what somebody thought it looked like and it's stuck. Males are X, Y. So males are interesting in the sense that that's a homologous pair right there that contains two different types of chromosomes, one X and one Y. Now the Y, it turns out, it's a very small chromosome. Uh, there are only a few genes on it. It's fairly well characterized, but we're going to focus on one or just a couple of genes there. The X is huge compared to the X. It's of normal size. What I mean by that, it's uh, about the size of one of the larger autosomes. And it has many genes, thousands of genes. And those genes don't have anything to do with sex per se, okay? So 
Think of the X chromosome as a relatively normal chromosome, and it's the Y that's sort of the strange one as things go. But whether you're XX or XY, obviously there are differences between males and females, but not in the sense of deep biological problem type, type differences. Okay? So a big question that we could ask, and I think it's an interesting one in terms of understanding the interplay between the sex chromosomes, is this. What actually determines the sex of an individual? Because there are two verily, sorry, very equally valid hypotheses that you could come up with, right? So if we say, in rather simply, but we want to keep it simple here. If XY equals male and XX equals female, can you see that there's two ideas that you could come up with about what really causes an embryo to develop down the male pathway or down the female pathway. In fact, uh, to look at them, embryos are completely gender neutral for about two weeks, and only after that do you see them sort of going down one road or the other. There are things going on in there, but I guess, so what I'm saying is this. You could make the idea, the hypothesis, that, you know, the X's, we're not sure what's going on with them, but it is in fact simply the presence of that Y chromosome there that causes one to go down the male pathway. And that's logical because females don't have any Y chromosomes, so they become female. Males do have a Y. So one hypothesis is that it's the presence of the Y chromosome that causes maleness, if you want to say it that way. The presence of the Y. But another reasonable hypothesis is that the Y really doesn't do anything much and that really it's the number of X's that one has that will make the determination about if they're going to become male or female. So that would be the dosage of the X. In other words, if you have two X's, you become female. If you have one X, you'd be male. And who the heck knows what's going on with the Y? These are both viable ideas. Now, there's a lot of evidence, and we do understand this rather well, but let me show you uh, some evidence that will allow us to decide or see which of these hypotheses is supported. In humans, and I have to stress that while we're interested in humans, there are many different sex determination systems. Even birds, who are reasonably close relatives of ours, evolutionarily speaking, have a completely different sex uh, determination model. So this pretty much goes for mammals and you know humans in particular is what we're, we're talking about. But just keep in mind that sometimes you'll see problems that bring up uh, Drosophila or different types of birds that, that do have a different type of system than we do. So here's an, uh, most of the early evidence, and it, it makes a lot of sense, comes from mutations or changes in which individuals actually have the wrong number of sex chromosomes. And what this means is you're supposed to have pairs, right? Whether it be XX or XY, you're supposed to have two. But there are individuals who have one, which is technically called a monosomy, and there are individuals that have three, which is technically called a trisomy. So let's check out two of the most uh, fundamental and reasonably common situations that can occur. There are individuals who exist who are XO. Now, XO means the O is just sort of like a placeholder. These individuals have one X and they have nothing else, so they really don't have a pair. Instead of two, they have one at that location. Just to make sure you understand what I'm saying, algebraically, right, a diploid individual is 2N. If you're missing one member of one pair, you're 2N minus 1. In humans, that would mean that this person has a grand total of 45 chromosomes, right? So the situation where you only have one X chromosome and no other member of the pair is known as Turner's syndrome. And as I said, uh, monosomy is a good word to know, meaning one, but one in the sense of where there should be a pair, now there's only one. So there's, in a sense, a dosage problem in that there's too little, right? You're supposed to...